Princeton off of Justice Hill yeah. on Elliott Road and, and so on. And I was at a conservation commission meeting in 19, in 19 before the pandemic started. And Mike Pinio mentioned something that was kind of interesting. He said, Mrs. Blanchard, who owned the apple orchard on the hill, in the 30s, she brought some bittersweet to the garden club and said, this is a wonderful thing to use for your Christmas decorations and wreaths. Well, in the 90s, her farm was going well. She had the largest apple orchard in New England, 8,500 trees. After 2000, she had stopped, the family stopped the farm. Every tree was totally inundated with bittersweet. So there's another comment. You know Route 12 divides Sterling. And you're gonna find on the north or the west side of Route 12 is inundated with bittersweet more than the south and the east side. And it's primarily because of that farm. So I just want to mention that we have Julian Reese from Bartlett Tree, and we have uh, some literature from his company and so on. And uh, you're welcome to take it after the talk. Thank you. This is Julian. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, thank, thank Paul and, and um, everyone that invited me to be here. Uh, my, my name is Julian. I'm an arborist with Bartlett Tree Experts. Um, and I'm also, I studied environmental science and biology uh, for, for my bachelor's degree. Um, so invasive plants are pretty close to my interest in, uh, you know, systems really. It's, uh, you know, how everything works together. Um, and that's, uh, that's a big part of what invasive species are. If we were to define them, um, they're typically non-native, so they're introduced, they're brought over um, to the local ecosystem. So um, it doesn't have to be intercontinental, it could be something from the west coast to the east coast, um, but they're introduced and if they are unchecked, they generally will outcompete um, native species in some way, um, and they can interrupt the biodiversity, uh, the ecosystem. Um, they can affect water water resources. When we think about, you know, invasive aquatic plants, uh, and they can affect certainly agriculture, apple orchards. Um, and food crops and forest production, um, as well as property values, right? Your own backyard um, certainly can be impacted by, by invasive in species as well. Um, so I always like to start with, you know, how did we get there, you know, uh, in the first place? I mean, yes, we introduced them where we move around the world, we bring plants in here, um, but Essentially, we've created space for them, um, you know, in the landscape. It's, it's disturbing an area. It's, uh, you know, clearing a site and then um, not planting that site right away. So um, I really think that landscape design principles are your first and foremost um, strategy with managing invasive species. If you leave an area without vegetation, generally invasive species are gonna move in there. So that's large areas of mulch, um, that's areas of dirt, like I said, dis disturbed sites, um, but also the edges of, of forests. So the transition from your, your lawn to whatever woods edge that might be or natural area. Um, so those are all the, places that invasive species can get started. So um, it's really important to sort of have a management plan um, starting with the design of the landscape. Um, so 
I say avoid mulched areas that are exposed, like meaning you want to interplant. You want layers of different plantings that will work well with each other because that will not leave much space for invasive species to get established. Um, they're still gonna pop in here and there, but um, they won't get a real foothold if it's already really crowded. So um, some things like I've kind of changed my mind on is you know spacing of shrubs. This is one I think everybody can relate to. Um, there's this idea you want everything individual, you want to see space in between them. Um, unfortunately, that leaves a lot of opportunity for weeds to move in. Um, so I encourage people to allow things to grow together, um, intermingle with each other, um, and use, like I said, different companion plantings, ground covers, um, mix a mix of you know, canopy from shade trees and ornamental trees to uh, mid-level shrubs like arborvitaes and rhododendron to lower growing plants like um, it could be uh, juniper type ground cover or uh, um, even cotton easter and then and then you have you know your really low layer could be you know pachysandra avinca there's some introduced stuff in there but it but those are not considered invasive because they don't out compete with native varieties so good good planning um, will generally leave you less susceptible to having these problems in the first place um, and then we move on to management ways um, and <clears throat> so starting with design cover crops interplanting layering um, but then what do we do when they get when they get established well we have mechanical methods right pulling small weeds um, bittersweet and others if they're if they're really young you can generally pull them out by hand but you got to get the root um, once once vines get large and established like bittersweet like uh, mile per minute like uh, Japanese knotweed um, those roots are really well established um, it's they the, uh, a root can be connected to multiple different vines um, it's near impossible to try to remove that by hand um, without c creating a, a huge mess. I mean, talking about bringing a backhoe type of situation and just demolishing the site. Um, so we have to look to other methods like using different chemical herbicides. Um, so some, some terminology I'm gonna use is like a foliage treatment where we can apply an herbicide to the foliage of a plant. We can do a stump treatment where you, you cut that vine and you paint the stump. Um, you can, with Japanese knotweed, you can do an injection because the stem is hollow and you can actually inject in the individual stem. Um, there's the hack and squirt, which is similar. You hack the plant and you generally if you if it's like a hollow stem like that you can you can inject it sort of but you don't need as many tools for that so um, once things get really bad generally you have to resort to some some sort of chemical management and with that said I do want to caution you about always reading the label and fo and following it um, I encounter cases like this on a pretty regular basis every year. Um, you can see the tree on the right uh, has no foliage. The one on the left is, is pretty sparse. Um, and unfortunately, um, this was, this was a, actually the, the product that the homeowner applied um, to manage weeds in their in their bed. You can see they have a mulch bed. There's a lot of space in between those plants. 
right? So there's a lot of areas for weeds to get established. Um, and it was kind of a shock to this homeowner when we kind of dug in and we eventually figured out um, this little spray bottle can kill mature trees. Um, so there's, there's a few that you really have to be aware of, um, but essentially anything that's extended control, ground clear, any of those key words used for hardscaping only, those types of things uh, can leach into tree roots. And what you even have to be careful about is hardscaping that's near trees, right? So uh, where a tree root can actually travel under a brick walkway. Um, and so I always recommend consulting with a professional that understands these, these products because unfortunately you go to Home Depot or Lowe's and there's a, a whole aisle that you're staring at, you know, 100 different labels and it's not very clear or, or they don't distinguish what is safe to use around trees, what is not. Um, and if someone has a question, um, a quick comment if you want to jump in. Just a quick question. What is hardscaping? I what? haven't ever heard of that. Hardscaping? Yeah, what is that? Like, uh, like a stone walkway or a brick walkway or a concrete, like a patio, any, anything that's not vegetation. Okay. So um, any kind of stone, concrete, brick. Asphalt. Asphalt, right? It could be cracks in the asphalt driveway that you got some weeds coming up through, but you might have a tree nearby. Those tree roots are going under the driveway. They're going under the walkway. Um, that's what we have to think about. Um, I'm going to have a little bit of time at the end for more discussion and specific questions, but if anybody has, like, needs some clarification on something, just please ask. So, um, jumping into some specifics, um, we're probably pretty familiar with this. Uh, uh, pretty attractive plant. Um, makes nice reeds, oriental bittersweet. Um, it, it can really get out of hand on, um, you know, climbing up trees. Uh, vines can grow up to 10 inches in diameter. Um, I've seen them grow 60 to 80 feet up into the canopy of a tree. Uh, they can they can damage a tree two different ways. They can actually shade it from the sun because the foliage of the bittersweet gets above the tree canopy. And so it starts to shade it, it out. Um, but if it's really wrapped around the stem, it can also, uh, it can also cause like choking of the tree as you see on the right there. Um, uh, kind of an interesting thing I'm thinking about the wreaths is you can have a dried wreath and throw it in a compost pile and those seeds will actually still germinate. Um, so you end up with a wreath or some decoration, just be careful how you dispose of it because it can actually um, still be viable. Um, best methods of management really really small new plants you can pull them if you can get the root system out um, if it's popping up in your lawn just you know m frequency of mowing making sure you're mowing frequent enough so that they're not getting established um, you can use the the cut cut the cut the vine and treat the stump method on this um, but generally there will still be some, it's usually not a one and done deal. You, you really gotta think of managing invasive species as a program. Um, it's something that you have to manage every year. Um, even if you get caught up and you get in really good shape, you always gotta be looking out for them, um, pulling them when you see them. But if they get really bad, you, you'll have to, um, resort to other methods. Um, 
Japanese knotweed. It's an herbaceous perennial. Um, it grows in extremely dense stands. Uh, so there, you, usually you'll see it on roadsides or you know creeping in the edge of your landscape. Um, and it'll just form a complete thicket. A lot of people call it bamboo. Um, it's not actually bamboo. It's a, like I said, it's a, it, it is a herbaceous. Um, it's, it can get up to 10 feet tall, which makes, you know, spraying it very difficult. Um, so best management practices, uh, if you have a, a couple plants, you could inject the stem or use the hack and squirt method where you hack the stem and then you squirt inside the hollow um, with some sort of herbicide. You can, but if you have a large area, the best thing to do is cut it down in June, which is after it's gotten a few feet hot, tall you cut it down in June and you wait eight weeks for the new growth to come up and it'll be a lot lower. And then you, and then you use uh, an herb, a foliar herbicide eight weeks later. If you use an herbicide too early in the season, the, the, the new leaves are, are so vigorous and they're pulling sugars out of the roots that it generally won't translocate down into the roots. So usually herbicides work much more effectively in the late summer and the fall because the plant is now moving sugars from its leaves down into the root system. Um, so you want, you want that downward movement. Um, and this, you know, cutting it is going to keep it lower so that it's easier to spray. Um, Fun fact about knotweed is the, the young shoots are edible and they're used in culinary in other parts of the world. I guess, I've not tried it, I don't know if anybody has, but it tastes similar to rhubarb, supposedly. Kind of the same kind of plant, you get the young stalks there. Um, so if you got a problem on your, your, your landscape, you know, one thing you can do is make a salad. <laughs> um, Multiflora rose, it's another introduced plant, can look pretty, um, but it can, you know, it can get pretty big, uh, you know, 10 by 10 feet, just a big mass. They can tangle up in other plants. Um, same kind of method, if it's really small, you can treat it with an herbicide. If it gets that big, you generally want to cut it first down to a stump let the regrowth come out and then treat it. These are, once again, plants that are really difficult to dig out because the root systems can get really extensive. And if you don't get all the roots, they, one root left can, can regenerate new, new plants. Um, an, another really common one on the landscape, um, many of these plants, have ornamental value. Um, we certainly have a lot of customers that you know still have burning bush. We take care of them um, by pruning them and and what they need. Um, but we don't recommend planting them. They're, you, they are on the invasive species list in Massachusetts. Um, it's pretty popular by uh, wildlife. You know, birds eat the berries. And that's how many of these are spread. Um, Japanese barberry and even the common barberry um, are, are invasive. Um, usually they were once used by farmers as a natural fence line for livestock. Um, and there are also these, there's these ornamental varieties that have Pretty attractive foliage, um, but they are they are pretty invasive and they're pretty thorny to deal with. Um, same kind of strategy as the multiflora rose. If it's small enough and you can you can get all the roots and dig it out, 
go for it. But once the plant gets pretty well established, you're better off cutting it to the ground, letting it regrow, sprout out, and then treating that regrowth about eight weeks later. Um, we have a couple, couple different tree varieties um, wanted to put out there. Um, Norway maple was a really commonly planted tree in uh, Worcester and many cities. Um, it was sort of a, re a replacement for the American elm and some other older street trees that um, were lost due to some introduced diseases. Um, it just is really aggressive growing. Um, it can form thickets that your native sugar maples and red maples can't really get established um, in these dense stands of Norway maple. Um, kind of an interesting fact is they, Norway maples do what's called a laopathy, where they release chem chemicals into the soil through their roots that suppress the growth of other plants. So a number of plants do this. Um, you might be familiar with black walnut and there's a lot of people, you know, you don't plant a black walnut near your garden or don't plant a garden near the black walnut um, because a lot of plants will not do well because it's releasing chemicals into the soil. Plants have their own chemical warfare that they play with each other. Um, that, you know, they're, they're all trying to do the same thing, which is survive. Um, they don't know any better, so they're just doing their thing. And um, Norway maples are one of them, and they just, it's hard for the native species to get established. Russian olive or autumn olive, I don't know if anybody have all seen these. It's pretty common in fields. A lot of fields that if you just leave them to go fallow, those, that will get started. Um, can look kind of attractive too and be like a multi-stem shrub, um, but also something that is um, spread by birds, uh, fa fairly invasive and aggressive in getting established. Um, we put up a couple of additional resources. Um, where you can find out more information. Pretty much your, your major sites like the US Forest Service, Mass Audubon, and Mass.gov, they all have their own invasive species pages and resources. Um, invasive, you know, there's many invasive species in all like animal groups um, between certainly insects. Many of you all have heard of the Asian longhorn beetle um, that we been dealing with in Worcester. Um, there's the emerald ash borer now, which is which is a new one um, in this area, and that's a that's a much quicker mover. Um, there's no real quarantine strategy. It's basically ash trees are either you either have to treat it to keep it alive, or it's going to be uh, succumb to emerald ash borer. Um, covered a lot. Um, I, pre I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak with you folks. Um, I do have to leave in a, in a few minutes, but I, I did have some brochures, I have some cards and stickers. Now I'm going to finish just by making a comment about this. We have a lot of this around Sterling. This is your bittersweet. It's probably not as, as tight as you see in this picture. But as you're driving home, if you go by Sterling Inn, great big bush in the front is bittersweet. And in back of the Sterling Inn is looking like this. And that's only one spot in Sterling. We have many. I have trees coming down. Liz, we have a tree coming down on, on Elliott Road right at the beginning. The town took one away um, as you come out on Justice Hill, there was one coming down. We're at a point that if we don't manage this, this will manage us. And that's the way your forests are going to look.
So thanks for coming. We appreciate Julian. Thank you. Thanks.